بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ياسين والقرآن الحكيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل تحييها الذي أنشأها أول مرة وهو بكل خلق عليم الذي جعل لكم من الشجر الأخضر نارا فإذا أنتم منه توقدون أوليس الذي خلق السماوات والأرض بقادر بقادر على أن يخلق مثلهم بلى وهو الخلاق العليم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. إن شاء الله we're going to be studying ayahs number 80 and 81 from Surah Yasin today. I recited from I recited from ayah number 79. The reason for that is to ayah number 80 and 81 are basically expounding on the general answer that was given in ayah number 79. Now going back a couple of even more ayat all the way back to ayah number 77 yesterday's lesson basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about this human being this arrogant conceited deluded self-important human being who actually thinks he can sit there argue with Allah and his messenger and the Quran not only that but then gives examples and evidences and has a whole theory a whole argument constructed to try to establish the fact that he's right and Allah and his messenger and the Quran are wrong and so this individual was spoken about this type of a person these people were spoken about and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about how arrogant they are and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuted their, their delusions and their, their arrogance and he answers their objections in a very powerful manner which was ayah number 79 in which Allah says well, yuhiha, you tell them, say yuhiha, the one that will bring because remember I mentioned how a man, these individuals, these people like Abu Jahl and Al-As ibn Wa'il and, the, and Ubay bin Khalaf these people actually would pick up like dead, they would pick up like uh, bones, decomposed bones and they would bring them to the Prophet ﷺ, literally like rub it in his face, he would stick the, these bones in his face and they would say, you're trying to tell me somebody's going to bring this back to life? Who could do that? So this arrogantly, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses, responds to them by telling the Prophet ﷺ, you answer them, you tell them. And once again, going back to the beginning of the surah, there's an education in da'wah, and in da'wah methodology here, that while we are supposed to be very humble and we're supposed to be kind and we're supposed to be generous and thoughtful when giving da'wah at the same time we also need to be assertive and we also need to be very intelligent and very clear about what our message is and this doesn't mean that we engage in a confrontation you don't push them back you don't punch them in the face and start a fight no 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 but you do talk you do speak up and you say let me let me answer your questions let me answer your objections for you let me tell you where you're confused this much needs to be said, must be said. That's the whole essence of da'wah. Clarifying people's misconceptions. Trying your best to try to talk sense into people who have no sense left within them. So, قُلْ Say to them, say, يُحْيِيهَا The one that will bring these back to life, these dead decomposing bones are literally turning to dust when you touch them, falling apart when you hold them in your hands. الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً I explained this yesterday. The one who not only created them, but raised them, grew them in the first instance, in the first place. وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٍ And he is completely informed at all times of everything that he has ever created. All of his creation, he's completely informed of it. He keeps tabs on it all the time. He knows exactly what's going on. Now this answer is being explained. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to provide two thoughts or two lines of logic or two lines of reasoning to substance to substantiate this answer and this idea that has been pre uh, presented to them as a rebuttal to their ignorance and their arrogance the first one is in ayah number 80 so the first 
line of reasoning or the first proof or evidence of the answer that's been given to them that Allah is going to bring it back to them. Allah will. I mean, what's, what's so hard for you to understand about that? You know why it shouldn't be hard for you to understand that? Proof number one. Ayah number 80, Allah says, الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّجَرِ الْأَخْضَرِ نَعْمًا He is the one that created for you, that made for you rather. He is the one that made for you from the green tree a fire. He is the one that made for you from, from the green tree, He made fire for you. Now what does that exactly mean? It almost sounds like I'm speaking in code. He made fire for you from the green tree. That's a literal translation. Let me explain exactly what this means. Shajar al akhdar the green tree. So tree is very obvious what it means. What, what's meant by a green tree is this isn't like a figure of speech. This is an idiom within the Arabic language. It, an expression, if you will. It actually refers to a tree that is still very moist. It's still very full of life. And it's still capable of growing. Not like a tree that's withered up and it's dried up and it's old or not a tree that's been cut down, not a dead tree, but a tree that's still alive, that's still growing like in springtime. Leaves are still budding out of it. That branch of that tree, that in Arabic they refer to it as a green tree or a green branch. It's very obvious why, because it can still grow. So it's still moist, it's still full of life. Now the explanation of how does fire come from that? So the first interpretation or understanding of this is, there were two types of tree that were famous in the in that area of Hijaz in the Arabian Peninsula. One is called the tree of Marh and the other is the tree of Afa. And the air the, these trees were very unique because the branches of these trees, even though even when they were still very alive and very moist and capable of growing, the Arabs, they, uh, these two different types of trees, you could take one branch of this and one branch of that, and when you would rub them together, it would work like firestone. They would start to spark against each other even though they were still moist. But you would have to take one from Marh and a branch from the tree of Afa, the type of tree called Afa, and when you rub them together, then they would spark and they could create a fire. And this is how the Arabs were very conveniently and easy, uh, it was very easy for them to start a fire, to basically light a fire for themselves. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pointing this out. Why? Because look, the, the contradiction, that, or the contradiction that this mushrik, this disbeliever, he sees, is that this is dead. This is so dead, it's beyond dead. It's just gone. The bone is falling apart. It's turning into dust. It's finished. There's nothing left. What, what are you talking about? How is life going to come out of this? This is a contradiction that this mushri cannot get over. You're saying this will come back to life. That makes no sense. It's gone. It's finished. It's ancient history. What are you talking about? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, you know, you see life coming from this dead object to be something that just, it's two opposites. So they can't have anything to do with each other. When all you simply have to do is when you light a fire for yourself tonight, when you light your stove tonight, and you use these moist branches that are, you know, typically fire can't be started with them. They're not the typical uh, type of wood that is used for, fi for fire, as fuel for the fire. But you're still able to bring fire out from something that is still moist, it's still green, it's still got fluid water inside of it, liquid inside of it, but you're bringing fire from it. That in and itself is also two opposites that are coexisting. You know, and, and then all around us, the Quran points out other places as well, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّدِ Allah brings the living from the dead and the dead from the living. This has a spiritual application that, you know, when somebody takes shahada, somebody accepts iman, it's literally like a dead heart became a living heart. And when somebody loses their iman, it's as if the living heart became dead. But it also has a physical application as well. That every spring, these trees, they die and they wither, and they, every winter, they dry up and they die and they wither, and every spring, Allah brings them back to life. This earth seems barren during the winter, and Allah will bring it back to life in the spring. So there is this constant system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put into place, so this should not confuse you in any way. This is something you see, this is something you use on a daily basis. So very practical proof, a very practical evidence is being given to them. 
He is the one that made for you from the green tree, the moist branches. He, allow, he makes fire from there for you. And the second understanding or second interpretation, which both meanings, both interpretations can coexist, the Qur'an is that deep, it has layers to it, is that some of the scholars also point out that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alluding to here is that these same branches and leaves and trees that are moist during the spring and they're green and they're growing, eventually when they dry in the winter and they, get, and they die, those things become the best form of fuel for a fire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings it around. Also at the same time, like green leaves. What color did they start to become when fall occurs? They turn yellow and orange, red and yellow and orange. They turn these colors, which is the color of fire. So you see literally going from being green to the color of fire. So all these different meanings are built into this ayah. But the scholars, majority of the scholars of tafsir, more specifically point to that first ex explanation I gave, that you're able to take a branch from the tree of Mah, a tree, a branch from the tree of Afal, rub them together and they're still moist, and it's literally like firestone, sparks start to fly from them. Because Allah says, Ash-shajari He makes it very specific, it's ma'arifah, ma'arif billah. So it's as if Allah is saying, THE green tree. So He's specifically referring to that. The moist tree, the moist branches of the green tree. Then all of a sudden what happens? You start using that to light a fire. You've been using that to light a fire. And you keep using it to light a fire. In, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already said, fire comes from that. Then why does He then go on to say, All of a sudden, you just start lighting fires using it. You start using it to light a fire. Because this word Ida, I've explained this before, it shows shock and surprise. It shows shock and surprise. I talked about this yesterday. Amazement. That isn't it amazing that you as human beings automatically knew to go to this tree, break a branch off of here, go to that tree and break a branch off from there, start rubbing them together and make fire to, to cook things and to gain warmth and to make light at night? Like who told you to do that? Who told human beings to do it this way? To, to, to start using these branches and to build a fire like that? Who taught them to do that? This is something like naturally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala programs the human being to know how to survive. This is very, very, this is a very lengthy discussion, but this is explained in a few ayat of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, خَلَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى Allah created each and every single thing and then gave it guidance. What, not guidance in the way we understand as a spiritual guidance. Iman and amal and... No, no, no. Guidance as in basically programmed every form of creation to be able to exist, to be able to live, to know exactly what to do. Who, who teaches the child to suckle? Or to cry? Who programs, who taught the child to do that? Who teaches the child? Nobody does. It's as if it's instinct. Naturally, the human being knows how to do that. Fitrat Allahi lati fatara nas aliyah. This is the fitra that Allah has programmed within the human being, and this is part of one of the greatest blessings of Allah. How does how does that child know? Aside from even looking at the people around him, but just instinctively, the child knows that when he wants to pick up something and put it in his mouth, uses his hand, not his foot. He just knows. And so this is that that blessing of Allah Subhanahu. He doesn't let us just roll around on this earth like wild animals and wild beasts trying to figure things out. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has programmed His creation. He gives a guidance to what to do and how to do it and where to do it and how to go about in fulfilling and satisfying the needs of the human being. So, فَإِذَا أَنْتُمْ مِنْ مُتُوْقِدُونَ He just naturally one day got up and said, look, this looks interesting. Alright, that also looks interesting. Boom, now you have a fire. So this is the blessing of Allah. Think about this for a second. This, this leads you back to one logical, obvious conclusion. Allah. So that's the first line of evidence, the first line of proof that, that is being presented. And this is also alluded to in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, ayah number 71 and 72, where Allah says, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ النَّارَ الَّتِي تُوْهُونَ Don't you see the fire that you, that you light and you burn and you continue to fuel it? أَأَنْتُمْ أَنْشَأْتُمْ شَجَرَتَهَا أَمْ نَحْنُ الْمُنْشِئُونَ Are you the one that basically grew the tree? that you use to fuel the fire? Or are we the ones who grew that tree? Allah is saying. 
Meaning Allah again is making that connection. A tree is representative of life. It's a symbol of life. It's representative of life. It's green. It grows. Provides food. It's, it's, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why He even uses as a metaphor, as an example, the parable of the tree for iman, even spiritual life. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing that you also use it to light a fire. Which is, which is a sign of death and destruction, fire. But there's a connection between tree and fire. So these opposites can coexist like this. This is by the will and the decree and the design from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't let this confuse you that dead people can, you know, can't come back to life. This is very, it's, it should be easy and simple for you to understand that Allah can bring people back. In the next ayah now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ayah number 81, he says, أَوَلَيْسَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِقَادِرْ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَخْلُقَ مِثْلَهُمْ بَلَىٰ وَهُوَ الْخَلَاقُ الْعَلِيمُ Allah says that, and is not the one, isn't the one who created the heavens and the earth. Isn't the one who created the heavens and the earth fully capable? بِقَادِرْ Isn't he fully capable? The one who created, look at the heavens and look at the earth. This has already been spoken about earlier in the surah. Like I told you, this is the conclusion of the surah. So it's kind of wrapping up everything that's been talked about before. In the passage about Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, it talked about this. Look at the dead earth. Then Allah gives it life. And small grains start to grow out of the earth. A few blades of grass. A few things start to grow here and there. Then what happens? All of a sudden, before you know it, there's whole gardens. There's date tree, date palms, and then there's uh, grapes, and there's all these fruits and vegetables. Everything that's growing from uh, all this vegetation that's growing from this. Before you know it, there's spring shooting out of that same piece of land, the same chunk of land that was there a while ago. And then you're eating from it, you're enjoying it, you're benefiting from it. Why aren't you grateful? Allah said, Wa ayatul lahum al-layl. Look at look up at the sky. Naslahu min hun nahar. Allah said, we pull the um, we pull the day back away from the night. Slowly, slowly, slowly the day just decreases until it becomes light. Alright, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Look at the look at the sun. Washamsu tajiri li musakarillah. Look at the sun is so obedient, following exactly the, the pattern and the timings that Allah has set aside, set for it. Look at the moon. Look how it goes through the different stages. I explained. It's, it, it's, there's even a spiritual lesson here. How like the human being grows and goes through these different stages of life. Look how the moon is also going through its cycle. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already told us in detail. Explain to us. Look at the earth. Look how amazing Allah's created the earth. Look at the look up at, at the sky. Look at all the amazing creation of Allah that you see up at the sky. The sun and the moon and the stars and the day and the night and all these amazing things. Allah created them. Observe them, appreciate them, and let them lead you to Allah. Ayah. It should lead you straight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is not just concluding here and he says, Go back and read those ayat. Read throughout the Quran. Go take a look for yourself. This amazing ground and this amazing sky that Allah has created. So the one who created the sky and this earth and everything that's in it and everything that's between it, isn't he capable that he could create the likes of these people? Meaning he could reconstruct their bodies, he could give them similar physical forms as they have right now? Isn't it possible? The one who could make all of this, what difficult would this be? This human being that's five, six feet tall, and it's very amazing the body of the human being, but just look around you, look everything else Allah has created. Is this human being this arrogant? That he thinks that the Allah who created everything, fully capable, controls everything, runs everything, sustains everything, provides for everything, that he can't just reconstruct this human being after he's dead, after he's died, after he's decomposed. Really? Is he that simple-minded? That's why Allah says, 
people that do come to these realizations, they are the ones who have been guided by Allah, Allah has guided them, and these are the people of intelligence, thinking. These are the people who's, who are using their minds, whose brains are functioning. Otherwise, it's, it's as if these people have the full potential, like I mentioned earlier uh, in, in, in the Durus, I mentioned earlier in one of the lessons, that these people are fully functional. They're going to work, they're going to school, they have jobs and careers and degrees and families and money, cars, houses, bills. They're, they're fully functional. But it's as if when it comes to this area, this, the, 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 it comes to understanding their purpose in life. The oneness of Allah, the greatness of Allah. It's as if their brain shut down. They just don't function anymore. They can't think clearly. So Allah says, وَلَيْسَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ بِقَادِرٍ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَخْلُقَ مِثْلَهُمْ Is it, Don't you think He's fully capable of creating the likes of them? And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مِثْلَهُمْ مِثْل means just like something. Like the example of something. The resemblance of something. Like the mirror image of something. Alright, that's why you can reflect on it, you can look on it, and you see resemblances, you see similarities. Because another place in the Quran, Surah Al Qiyamah, we actually recited it in the, in the portion of Taraweeh today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ala an nusawiya banana. Najma'a ibama. Bala qadirina ala an nusawiya banana. This human being really thinks, Ayah Sabul Insan? Ala najma'a ibama. He really thinks we can't collect his bones back together? He doesn't think we can put him back together again. But Allah says, most definitely, he's wrong. No doubt, most definitely, we can totally put him back together again. But Allah says, to the extent where we can even put his fingerprints exactly back the way they were. So if there was a fingerprint scanner on the Day of Judgment, you'd come right up in that database. Alright? Now your parking tickets would come up. Put you right back together, just the way you were. In this dunya. <laughs> then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, response, bala. Now, this is interesting. This is a little bit of a discussion of language, rhetoric. You know, everybody knows where rhetorical question is. You don't, that's the whole point. You don't answer the rhetorical question. You really think I can't do that? Yes, I think. No, you don't answer that. It, it, it's a rhetorical question. All right? But at the same time, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks rhetorical questions throughout the Qur'an. Previously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah, أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الْإِنسَانِ Hasn't this human being considered? Hasn't he realized? أَوَلَمْ يَرَى Haven't they thought about the fact? Allah has asked many rhetorical questions so far throughout the surah. Now here at the conclusion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not leaving even the slightest room for any misunderstanding. You know sometimes somebody, if they ask a rhetorical question, just the tone of it is a little bit confusing. So you're not sure, does he want us to answer or not? You know? You get confused a little bit. So Allah SWT leaves no room for confusion here. Not at all. He answers. He, he is asking the question that he definitively, conclusively, finally just answers, answers the question. Gives the answer. No room for confusion. I don't want you to try to figure out whether this was a rhetorical question or not. What is the answer? What's not the answer? Allah answers it. Very, very definitively. He says what? Bala. No doubt. That they, do they really think? Awalaysa Nadi is not the one who the one who created the heavens and the earth. Isn't he fully capable of recreating them? Making them back the way that they were? Unless it's most definitely he is. There's no doubt about the fact that he is fully capable. Bala. In fact. He is Al-Khalaq. Al-Khalaq, everyone's heard of the word Khalid. It's one of the names of the attributes of Abdul Khalid, like we say. So Al-Khalid is Allah, the one who creates. Khalaq is the exaggerated form of that word. As hyperbole, mubalaqa. Alright, so it's the, it's the exaggerated form of the word. It basically means the one who, create, who has created everything. The one who creates everything and creates things beyond your imagination. He can create better, more, and just so much that you can't even fathom, you can't even imagine. And he's been creating since the beginning and he is still creating and he will continue creating. Everything, at all times. And in such, at such a scope, at such a level, 
that you can't even imagine, you can't even fathom. Al-Khalaq. Al-Khalaq al alim Not only is he creating everything, and this is how the attributes of Allah very beautifully they complement each other in the Quran. Because one thing is somebody might make a lot of something, somebody might make a bunch of things, and then he sells them, and then does he keep tabs on every single product that he made, every single unit that he created, that he made? No. But no, Allah is alim. He creates each and every single thing, and then he's fully informed about it. He has full knowledge of it. He, it's always under his control, it's always under his eye. He's watching it, he's listening to it, he knows about it, he's keeping tabs on it, it never escapes his knowledge. He's, he's always in control. Allah who khaliqo kulli shay, Allah is not just the creator of each and every single thing. Wa hu ala kulli shayin wakil. But then he's responsible for everything, he's keeping tabs on it. It's like he's got it on a leash. Just pull it back whenever he wants to. Everything's under his control. So there's no such thing of Allah creating something and then it just kind of existing on its own. No, no, no. Everything Allah creates is fully under His control, completely under His watch, in His knowledge, and is completely dependent and in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It never becomes independent. It never becomes an independent entity. It's constantly in need of Allah and it cannot exist for a second. It can't do anything without the will, the permission, and the decree and the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَهُوَ الْخَلَّابُ الْعَلِيمُ And this is, uh, this is the progression of thought. This is the progression of this idea, this answer that's being given to these people. That's why I kind of restarted back from ayah number 79. Because at the, at the end of ayah number 79, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had answered them by saying, وَهُوَ بِكُلْمِ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمُ That He's fully knowledgeable, constantly knowing of everything that He's created. All of the creation. He's completely in knowledge of everything, at all times. So Allah SWT said that before. Now it's as if it's just being completely, it, it's, it's, it's being said in even a stronger tone. It's just the argument is being sealed, done, finished, no more. No more room for discussion. وَهُوَ الْخَلَّاقَ الْعَلِيمِ Not only is He the one who created everything, but He created things you can't even imagine, you don't even know about. He's even creating right now at this second without, without you even realizing that. And al -ali. And he's constantly informed, always knowledgeable, always watchful over each and every single thing that he has created. So inshallah, this ends ayah number 81. Uh, tomorrow, inshallah, we'll be doing the last two ayat. And then uh, inshallah, on Tuesday night, we'll have some concluding thoughts and kind of a recap of the surah and kind of uh, make an observation of the placement of the surah. How the surah... Uh, is placed between uh, other surahs and how it relates and connects to the themes and the concepts and the ideas that are presented in the surahs that both come before it and come after it. So we'll have some concluding thoughts on it as well, inshallah. Subhanallah, wa bihamdi, subhanakallah, wa bihamdi, ashallahu la ilaha illa anta,